On October 24, 2022, the European Council gave its final approval to the Common Charger Directive, making it the law of the land. This was exactly 13 months since the proposal was tabled, and nine months after EU member states unanimously agreed to adopt a common charger. The EU was motivated by the increasing environmental catastrophe brought about by electronic waste. For example, in 2020, EU consumers bought 420 million electronic devices, with the average consumer owning three different chargers. There are thousands of tons of charging cables thrown out each year in the EU, not to mention the hundreds of thousands of miles of copper wire in them that has to be mined from the ground. The new rules will standardize charging for a wide range of portable devices, like mobile phones, tablets, cameras, laptops, headphones, keyboards, etc. This means in the near future, EU residents can theoretically own a single cable and go on with their lives as they do today. From the get-go, it was clear who the main target was, Apple. It is the only major consumer electronics company that uses their own proprietary connector standard, the lighting connector. This was a long time coming, and Apple's decision in 2020 to unbundle chargers from the iPhone was seen as an anticipatory move, a way to reject conformity. The connector of choice as formerly adopted by the EU is the USB Type-C. The USB Type-C, or simply USB-C, is a versatile and powerful connector standard. It is an upgrade from the previous standards, USB Type-A and USB Type-B. Type-A and B come with many limitations. For example, there are different variants for every use case. The cables used on printers, for instance, are not the same as those used on older smartphones. You'll find Type-B mini connectors, Type-B micro connectors, etc. Another big limitation for Type-A and B is their lack of fast power delivery. Further, they are not bidirectional, which means power can only flow in one direction. Devices cannot charge each other. Type-C was introduced to change that. On top of having bidirectional power capabilities, Type-C cables also have higher data transfer rates. Further, Type-C connectors and ports are standard in size, shape, and appearance. They have no up or down orientation, meaning there is no wrong way to plug them in. The connectors on both ends are also similar, so any end can go into the device. The transition to Type-C presents a future where you only need a single cable in your life. Apple, being one of the biggest players in consumer electronics, has been the main hindrance to this utopia. The company has stuck with its lighting connector since the introduction in 2012. Although they have transitioned some of their devices like the MacBook and iPad to Type-C, their most popular device, the iPhone, still comes with a lighting connector. It has been a money-making machine for them long before they decoupled it from iPhone's packaging. Apple claimed that the reason they removed the charger from the box was to help the environment. The $6.5 billion they saved along the way totally had nothing to do with it and was just a pleasant surprise. Other than direct-to-consumer sales, Apple has also made their lighting connectors a cash cow in other ways. Take for example the Made for iPhone program. Simply known as MFI, the program is open to accessory developers and manufacturers who wish to create hardware accessories that use Apple technologies to connect electronically to Apple devices. The licensed technologies include AirPlay Audio, CarPlay, Find My Network, GymKit, HomeKit, iPod Accessory Protocol, IAP, MFI Game Controller, MFI Hearing Aid, and Wi-Fi Accessory Configuration. The components covered include the Apple Watch Charger Module, Lighting Port Adapters, Headset Connectors, MagSafe Charger Module, plus more. The program is open to anyone. All you need to do is provide Apple with a product plan detailing which MFI technology you want to integrate. Then you design develop, and test the accessory. Finally, you submit production-ready samples and final packaging to Apple for review and certification. If approved, you can then proceed to mass production with the requirement that your product bears one of these MFI badges. MFI license holders are prohibited by a non-disclosure agreement from revealing how much fees they pay. However, as Apple products have gotten more popular, that fee has come down. The program was originally conceived in January 2005 as the Made for iPod program. The fees then were rumored to be $10 per product, or 10% of the total retail cost of the accessory, whichever was greater. 
This was then reduced to between 1.5% and 8% of the total retail price. In 2014, the rate was set at a flat $4 per connector. That is believed to be the fee to this day. Apple deliberately hides their licensing fees in a shroud of mystery while releasing their earnings report. The company breaks down its revenue into five segments. These are iPhone revenue, iPad revenue, Mac revenue, services revenue, wearables, and home accessories revenue. Revenues that do not come directly from device sales are bundled in the services segment. This includes revenue from the App Store, Apple Care, Apple Music, Apple TV Plus, Apple News, iCloud, Apple Pay, and any other subscriptions. Basically, services is a catch-all segment for Apple's non-hardware sales. Licensing also falls in this category. In 2021, Apple's services revenue was $68 billion. That was a 27% increase from 2020 when services revenue was only $53 billion. However, there is no detailed breakdown on how much each service brought in individually. Financial analysis, however, estimate that licensing makes up between 15 and 20% of the service's revenue. So in 2021, the company made close to $14 billion from licenses. But even that doesn't tell the full story. According to a 2020 report by Forbes, Google paid Apple close to $9 billion that year in order to be a default search engine on Safari across all devices. There are other conflicting reports on this, but most figures tend to be between 8 and 12 billion annually. What is clear is that this is an agreement that is extremely profitable for both companies, but has put them in crosshairs with regulators. This deal is part of an antitrust case brought by the United States Justice Department. It would not be far-fetched to state that 60 to 90% of Apple's licensing revenue comes from Google. Let's take a middle number, 70%. In 2021, if Google paid Apple $10 billion, all other licensing fees accounted for $4 billion. We now start to get a clear picture of how much Apple makes from the Made for iPhone program. Like every big tech company, Apple holds thousands of patents. They cover everything from the user interface to display technology, streaming to networking, artificial intelligence to charging, virtual reality to the accessories themselves. Licensing these patents out of other manufacturers brings a constant and consistent stream of revenue to the company. This revenue also falls in the services category. Apple is very secretive on what patents, if any, it licenses out, so there is no way to put a dollar figure on it. Even without having the breakdown, we can make an educated guess and conclude that Apple makes a substantial amount from using the MFI certification to accessory manufacturers likely something between one and three billion dollars. While that is a small portion of Apple's overall revenue, a billion dollars would make a significant portion of most companies' revenue. Apple reported revenues of $365 billion in 2021. The made for iPhone licensing program therefore constituted less than one percentage point. In short, Apple would barely feel anything if the whole program was scrapped. But nevertheless, the company has for the longest time been opposed to the forced transition to Type C. After all, what good is an American company that leaves money on the table? Apple has stated that they intend to comply with the EU directives. The mandate comes into effect in 2024 for most devices, but laptops get a longer grace period until 2026. Many experts predict that the company will make the changes across the board and will not have a special European iPhone. What if USB Type-C connectors become obsolete, you may ask? Well, through some clever design and engineering, the USB Type-C is designed to last a very long time. Remember, its predecessors have been around for close to three decades and are still widely used to this day. Being the Type-C is better designed and more versatile, we can expect it to last just as long, if not longer. There could be future improvements, but all within the Type-C architecture. If a time comes when USB Type-C becomes obsolete, it is very likely we'd have to move on to a completely wireless world.